name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all going to be. Um, so tonight is uh, Tuesday night of the Holy Pascha, and tonight's talk will be titled, um, In the Cross There is Life. So in the cross there is life. So I'd like to start by looking at um, John chapter 14, where it says, or where we read how Thomas is speaking to Jesus. And he says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? So Thomas is asking Jesus this question. And Jesus responds to him and says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so it makes us ask a question. Well, what is the way that, cho that Jesus chose? What is this way that Jesus chose? Um, and as we know, Jesus chose the way of the cross, which brings us to the message of tonight, which is that in the cross there is life. And mainly because Jesus is life, because Christ is life. So in the cross there is life, because Christ is life. And so it makes us ask the first question then, which is, well, what is the meaning of the cross? Um, and as we know, the cross symbolizes God's love for us. You know, since the beginning of time, God has declared his love for mankind in many different ways. All of God's work declare his love for us, from designing us in his image and likeness, to the plants and the animals and the universe that God created for us. God did all of this out of his love for us. However, humanity persisted in drawing away from God, you know, by pursuing our own selfish ambitions, pursuing our own pride, pursuing our own sinful desires. You know, all of this drew us away from God and made us go away from him. However, we know that the wages of sin is death, you know, whether it's emotional death, physical death, or even ultimately spiritual death. This is the pathway of sin. These are the consequences of sin. And so the consequence then of sin is death. Uh, but God, out of his love for us, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation of our sins. You know, in other words, the propitiation meaning that, you know, Christ paid the price of our sins or he made amends for our sins. But not just to pay the price of our sins, but in addition, Christ went actually over and above that uh, by actually offering us everlasting life. Which is why when we read in John chapter 3 verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should have everlasting life. And again, we read in Romans chapter 6 verse 23 where it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Christ gives us this everlasting life through the cross. You know, by dying on the cross and sacrificing his life for us, out of his love for us, Christ gives us this life through the cross. Which makes us realize that it's not so much the cross itself that is life, but rather Christ is life and Christ through the cross gives us life. And so Christ chose to use the cross to show his love for us and to open to us the door to eternal life with God. And so God chose something as horrible, as gruesome, as unimaginable as the cross to show us his love for us, the price that he's willing to pay for us and to give us his un this unimaginable gift of eternal life with him. And so we see that Christ turns defeat into victory. He turns sorrow into joy and he turns death into life. And it's all through the cross. And we, fortunately, we have the, the benefit of foresight. We know how this ends. We know that ultimately Christ, yes, he dies on the cross, but he resurrects. He rises from the dead and he overcomes death and he opens to us this door of eternal life. You know, and it's so amazing that that not only does Christ come and pay the price of our sins, but he goes over and above it and he gives us this wonderful gift of everlasting and eternal life. You know, and so when we look at the cross, we are reminded that Christ is life and that through the cross, Christ gives us life. And so in a way... You know, the cross, therefore, is life because Christ is life and he gives us life through the cross. So this is why, therefore, that there's life in the Christ, life in the cross, because Christ offered us life through the cross. And so it brings us to the next point, which is, well, how do I pursue this everlasting life? I need to ask myself this question. Well, we know that, you know, we know the meaning of the cross. We know that through the cross there is life. So then now you have this everlasting life. Christ offers us this everlasting life. So how do I pursue this everlasting life? What do I need to do to have this true life, this everlasting life for myself? And so we can learn a few lessons from today's readings. You know, one of the first lessons that we can learn is to be watchful. Uh, we need to be watchful because Christ tells us to be watchful a number of times. So for example, when we look at the third hour gospel of today, we read that it says, you know, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. 
And again, in the sixth hour gospel, it says, you know, in the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, it says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So Christ is therefore referring to the end of time, either the end of time of the world in general, or the end of my time. At the end of the day, at the end of the day Christ is referring to the end of time. Okay? And whichever comes first, whether it's the end of the world or the end of my time, either way it's the same for me, in that my time on earth will be finished and I will have no further chance to do anything else. I can't add or subtract for any, from any of my behavior on earth. Okay, which is why it's very important that the way we live on earth, you know, and part of that is exemplified in the parable of the talents, um, which I'll get to in a moment. Also, you know, again, Christ in the third hour gospel of tonight, he says, you know, as the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So remember, once I pass from this life to the next, Things for me, the thing for me to experience will be the coming of the Son of Man. So once I've passed away, that's it. The next thing that I have to look forward to is the, the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, it's the coming of God. We need to see what's going to happen. So in other words, therefore, I need to be prepared. I need to be prepared because I never know when God will call me to meet Him, to give an account of what I've done and the behavior that I've exemplified. You know, particularly with this precious life that God has given me. You know, it's a unique thing. It's a unique gift to be able to live. You know, not everybody gets that opportunity. But we have been given this gift. And so, because of this gift, God is going to ask us, He's going to say, well, what did you do with this gift that I gave you? What did you do with your life? How did you spend your time? And so, therefore, the first thing I need to do is be watchful. I need to be ready. I need to be prepared. And the second lesson that we can learn from tonight's reading is to be fruitful. Okay? Again, when we look at the ninth hour homily of this morning, where say, or Abba Shruti, the arch he says in the homily, he tells us how to use our time and he goes on to say, let's do the will of God as we have time to do the service of God. Remember that death does not delay and we are leaving the world. Where are all the people before us? Now all of them are lying down in their tombs. Let's give fruit according to God's grace which was given unto us. Okay, so as we know, time marches on. Time continues to march on every day and we cannot stop it. And every day we get closer to our inevitable death. You know, and we are called to give fruits according to God's grace while we have this life, while we have this opportunity to be here. You know, and some people ask, well, what, are the, what do you mean by fruits? Or what does Christ mean by fruits? And in a way, it's a, a simple way to understanding is by referring to your behavior. You know, do you behave in a way that's loving? Loving towards God, do you love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all, your, all of your uh, mind? And also, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Do you behave in a loving way? You know, and other forms of love or other forms of fruits, you know, obviously, as we know, the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control and gentleness. You know, am I, do I, am I kind to others when, when people are harsh to me? Am I patient with God? Am I patient with others, with, with my parents or with my siblings? You know, do I exemplify these fruits of the Holy Spirit? You know, it's a question for me to answer. It's a question for me to, to think about. Which brings us to the third point, which is basically then the last thing, the, the third lesson that we need to do is, um, it brings us to the concept of using our talents. So the third lesson is that Christ teaches us is to use our talents properly. We need to use our talents for the glory of God. You know, God has given us all different talents. You know, we may think that we have no talents, but the reality is every single person has been given a talent. Some of us may just be too lazy to cultivate that talent, but at the end of the day, we've all been given talents. And so these talents are like gifts, you know, they're skills, they're strengths, you know, they're blessings from God. It could be blessings on my time, blessings on my money. It could be a talent that's inherent in my personality or in the way that God formed me as a person. It could also be talents in relation to my circumstances, the connections, the people I know, the churches that I visit, the family that I'm born into. All of these are different talents, you know. And so the key thing here is that we need to, we need to use our talents for the glory of God, uh, to serve God with love and to serve others with love. And actually, God makes us a promise. He promises, He goes, if you use your talents properly, it will be added to you. And it, it will be increased. But if you don't, if you don't use it properly, you'll use it. So if you don't use it properly, you'll lose it. And we get that in the 11th hour of Tuesday morning's uh, readings, where it says, you know, in that parable of the talents, it says, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I, ha where I, where I have not scattered seed. 
So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. For him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the key then is that I need to use my talents properly. And if I do, God will bless it, and he'll bless it more, and he'll make it better. You know, that's his promise, and that's what he tells us. And the, the opposite is true. If I don't use my talents properly, if I use it for my own selfish desires, if I just bury my talents, those talents will atrophy. They'll wither and pass away, or they'll wither, and they won't be beneficial to either myself or to others. And so therefore, for me to choose life, you know, Christ gives us three lessons for tonight. First, I need to be watchful. Second, I need to produce fruits of love. And third, I need to use my talents properly for the glory of God. Which then, which then brings us to the third point, okay? Which is, well, when? When should I pursue this life that Christ has given me? You know, and the answer to that question is very simple. Now, now is the time to pursue those gifts. There's no better time. There's no better time to pursue the everlasting life that God has given us than now. Because there's no other time that's guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed for either me or you. But now, at least now I know I have this moment. So I can give God this moment. I can use this moment to try and lay hold of the everlasting life. This gift that God has presented to us. Okay, and so there's no better time. And we read in the sixth hour reading of tonight that the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. And it goes, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. So we need to be ready now, okay? Because sometimes once the door is shut, that's it. The opportunity passes, okay? Once the door is shut on my life, once my life has ended, the opportunity for me to do good, for me to develop my talents, for me to lay hold of this everlasting life is gone, okay? So I need to be ready now. And as we know in life, opportunities come and gone, go. Sometimes you have an opportunity waiting for you. It's there, it's ready for the taking. And if you take it, it's good, all good and well, and it can lead to you know, phenomenal things. But sometimes you let that opportunity go thinking and hoping that you'll get a second chance. But sometimes once the opportunity goes, you never get another go at it. You never get another look. So now God has given you this opportunity. He lays for you everlasting life and he says, here it is. Would you like to have it? You know, and now that we have the opportunity, we need to take it. Additionally, we also need to be weary. We need to be careful not to get too complacent. Okay, it's very easy to think, okay, yeah, there's the opportunity. I'm in the church. I listen to these live streams. I come to church to pray. I come from a good family. I, I see a woman regularly, so I'm good. You know, I'm on the right path. But sometimes that way of thinking can lead to me to become complacent. I can become lazy. I can start getting a bit lethargic. You know, I can just start going down the wrong path. Um, and, and there's a warning about that kind of thinking. There's a warning about that sort of behavior. And we read it in the, read it in the third hour of reading of tonight. Where it says, you know, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So it's not enough to be in the vicinity of Christ. It's not enough to just, you know, be sort of around Christ or be sort of like a fan of Christ. You know, we need to actually exert ourselves. We need to sort of give from our energy, give from our time, give from our, you know, our talents. We need to give because even though we're invited, we can lose our inheritance. And that's a fact, you know, we know that, for example, Judas himself, he lost his inheritance. You know, God invited him. He was one of the 12 disciples. He was in the vicinity of Christ. He had the best opportunity to lay hold of this everlasting life that Christ offered to him. Yet, Judas and sometimes myself, I choose and we choose, you know, the things of the world. We choose what the world has to offer and we don't actually choose the everlasting life that God gives us. So we need to be careful because we can lose it, you know. Um, and so God invites us to take part of the wedding feast, okay? Um, and we read in the first hour of tonight's reading the parable, of, the parable of the wedding feast, where it says, "But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw men there. Sorry, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment?' And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, "Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Who is this individual but Judas? Okay, and sometimes it's me. So I need to be careful so that I don't follow the same pathway as Judas. Okay, and lose my heavenly garment and become dressed in damnation. For every man, for every person that is called, you know, as we know in the Bible, it goes, for many are called, but few are chosen. And I don't want to be one of those that are few, that are the few that are, um, 
I don't want to be one of the many that are called that miss out on the choosing that God has uh, offered to us. So it's clear then now that the best time for me to reach out and to grab this everlasting life that Christ offers us is now. And we need to press on and we need to not give up because otherwise we may lose our inheritance. And so it's clear then when I look at the cross, or when we look at the cross, the cross symbolizes life to us because Christ who is life gives us life through the cross, you know, by dying on the cross for us. So therefore, I need to be watchful. I need to behave in a loving way and I need to use my talents for the glory of God. And there's no better time for me to start than now. I need to press on towards the goal and to copy Saint, what St. Saint Paul says. You know, I need to press on towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We need to do that. We need to press towards this everlasting life. And to conclude, we know that Christ, you know, Christ knew the penalty of our sins. He knew that the penalty was severe. Yet he prepared or he prepared to bear it in our stead. You know, this is why he said in John 15 verse 13, he goes, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down their own life or to lay down one's life for his friends. And Christ did that for us. Christ laid down his life for us out of his love for us. And more than just that, Christ actually offers us everlasting life. And so tonight we have a choice. We have an opportunity in front of us. Do we lay hold of everlasting life? Do we continue to press on? Do we continue to work towards this everlasting life, this gift that God has given us? Or do we get complacent and let go? Or do we just consider the, you know, the cares of the world, businesses and other things that we may have that are you know, engaging us? You know, and to, to lose sight of the eternal picture. And so tonight, you know, we have this opportunity. And the best thing for us to do is to try and lay hold of it and to take the opportunity while we have the chance. Glory be to God for a moment.